One of the events that, that really spurred public interest in DNA and applications of DNA technology was the uh, notorious O.J. Simpson murder trial. That was really the first time in America where DNA evidence was presented on live TV and people got fascinated that, wow, is that, was that blood sample really from O.J. Simpson, right? Was this DNA, is it reliable? And the outcome of the uh, trial, of course, is well known, but more importantly, it caused people to think, okay, can we really use DNA in this type of forensic uh, study to implicate uh, the, uh, the alleged criminals? Uh, how reliable is it? What do we know? What do we don't know about DNA in using um, forensic analysis? So since then, of course, the technology has improved. Uh, it's led to a thing in, in forensics called the CSI effect. We're familiar with the CSI TV show that popularized using DNA to catch criminals the next day. And uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating, but uh, the lawyers, the criminal lawyers, both prosecution and defense, talk about the CSI effect where juries, if they are uh, in a murder trial, if there's no DNA presented, they say, well, he must be innocent, otherwise they'd have DNA evidence. And on the other side, the defense will say, you know, once DNA evidence is provided in a murder trial, my client doesn't have a chance. The jury's already convicted him. And that's not fair. It's not fair on the prosecution side either. That's putting too much credibility on, on DNA as evidence. And I discuss this to, to a great deal in, in the book. What are the ins and outs? What level of reliability is there on, on DNA evidence. More recent times, uh, we, we have had a, a high profile case in California, the Golden State Killer, who was active uh, a number of years ago, was never charged, was never located, and then all of a sudden last year, he was arrested on the basis of DNA. And this was surprising because the killer, the alleged killer, never donated DNA. So how did we use DNA to match him with the DNA found at the crime sites? Well, it turned out to be secondary. That is, some of his distant relatives did DNA tests. And those DNA tests came up as a partial match to the crime scenes. So the investigators woke up and realized, hey, you know, these people who donated DNA were doing their family tree genealogy analysis. You know, these folks are actually related. Second cousin, third cousin, fourth cousin, something. So if we get the the family tree from these partial matches, we might be able to figure out who our, our real suspect is. And that's exactly what happened, that the um, Golden State Killer was eventually apprehended. Um, eventually, he was uh, charged on the basis of his own DNA, which was collected after the traditional uh, police detective uh, analysis. And uh, so, that's, it's opened up an entirely new field that we weren't really expecting. And of course, the Golden State Killer was never really expecting to get caught either. So an exciting area now, it opens up questions not only of the opportunity to identify these cold case murderers and rapists, um, but also questions of privacy. The people who donated their DNA to develop their family tree had no idea it was going to be used by law enforcement to look for criminals. So. Are, they, are, are their rights, privacy rights, violated or not? These questions need to be discussed by the public, not just by ner nerds and boffins like me as a scientist, but by everybody. Everybody has an interest in their own genetic privacy and everybody has a right to, to their opinion. So I would like those people t who offer an opinion to be well informed. What does a DNA test actually disclose. What do other people have access to when you do a DNA test to build your family tree? Do your matches have access now to your DNA sequence or just a portion of it? A big portion? A small portion? What, what are our rights with that? Those questions still remain unanswered. I want people to have a, a, a vigorous, passionate debate on that and come to some reasoned determination.